Hello, and welcome to the world of creativity and creative people. I am Marie Pareto Hedin, president of the Tufts Senior Connection, a shared interest group sponsored by Tufts University Office of Alumni Engagement. We design and present programs that we hope will be of special interest to alums 55 and older, but we welcome persons of all ages who find our programs intriguing. Today, we have an exciting program with three very creative panelists. Our moderator is Barbara B.A. Shapiro, the author of The Collector's Apprentice, as well as the best-selling novels, The Muralist and The Art Forger, all set in the art world. Her new novel, Metropolis, will be published in May of 2022. She is also the author of five previous novels. Her books have been translated into more than 10 languages and have won several prestigious writing awards. A true jumbo, Barbara earned a master's degree from Tufts in 1976 and a PhD in sociology in 1978. She was an adjunct professor of sociology at Tufts and taught creative writing at Northeastern University. Before turning to writing full time, Barbara also directed research projects for a residential substance abuse facility, worked as a systems analyst statistician, and headed the Boston office of a software development firm. Fortunately for us, she likes writing novels the best. Barbara, thank you for being with us today and for moderating our panel discussion. You are very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. So there are two other panel members here. And although the three of us have very different backgrounds, have very different degrees, have all kinds of different interest and expertise, we have one thing in common, and that's that we get to sit at home and make up stuff which isn't a bad job, um, but it does have some drawbacks. Um, we usually don't have any boss telling us that you have to do this and you have to do that. We often don't have any deadlines, which means we have to do it all ourselves and get ourselves to do it, which isn't always that easy. But that's what we're gonna talk about today is inspiration and, um, and perspiration, as, as they say, and creativity, and then the all important persistence, because without that, nobody would ever get anything done. We're gonna talk about how we're going to, how we find these things and how we corral them and how we use them together to produce a final piece of art. So, I want to first introduce Chris Castellani. Chris is the author of five books, most recently the novel Leading Men, which is really good, uh, for which he received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Mass Cultural Council, and the McDowell. The screen adaptation of Leading Men is currently being written by Matthew Lopez, The Inheritance, and produced by Peter Spears, Call Me By Your Name. Christopher is on the fiction faculty of the Warren Wilson MFA program and the, and the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. His collection of essays on the craft of fiction, the art of perspective, which also is really good, uh, is taught in many writing workshops. He lives in Provincetown in Boston, where he is the artistic director of Grub Street, the country's largest and leading independent center for creative writing. Thanks for being here, Chris. Thank you so much for having me, Barbara, and thanks so much to Tufts Connect for having us here. I would like to introduce Jan Parker. Jan is the Grammy Award winning, okay, now this is written in very small letters. <laughs> <laughs> you have it. Okay, is the Grammy Award winning, winning violinist and producer of 30 recordings. She is the founding executive director of Southwest Chamber Music, the Summer Festival at the Huntington and the Los Angeles International New Music Festival. Ms. Carlin has performed in Europe, Mexico, and the US and has taught at Pomona College at Claremont University. 
She led the largest cultural exchange in history in 2010 between the US and Vietnam, sponsored by the US Department of State. Currently, she and her husband serve as the first American artistic advisors to Vietnam, where they spend a portion of each year leading the Hanoi New Music Ensemble. Ms. Carlin earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Tufts with a double major in theater and music and a master's of music from Boston University. Her memoir, What's Next? Creativity in the Age of Entertainment, won Reader's Favorite and Book Excellence Awards. So thanks for being here with us, Jan. So, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to Tufts. I'm honored to be here. Very yeah. nice to be back at the community. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of humbling to be with you guys, but okay. <laughs> so to start off, um, I'd like the three of us to talk a little bit about that elusive uh, inspiration. You know, where does it come from? How do we use our creativity to wrestle it into uh, something solid, a solid piece of work? So Jan, why, you're both a musician and a writer. So can you talk about how inspiration differs in those two fields? If it does, maybe it doesn't because I don't have multi-talent, so I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> and, um, you know, how, um, if so, how do you work them through differently? And what about the creative piece? Is that different in writing and different in uh, creating music? Well, it's all creative. Um, one thing I wrote down, I was looking up, the Oxford Dictionary defines inspiration as the process of, and process being very important of being mentally stimulated to do or feel something, especially to do something creative. So it is a process. I mean, when you're inspired, you're inspired from your family, you're inspired from your teachers. Anyone who is a writer is a reader. We all love to read or we wouldn't have been become uh, writers. And I wrote as part of my career as a musician and as an executive director because I was writing grants from day one. I was writing, uh, helping uh, put together uh, booklets for the CDs, um, program notes, you know, it, it, there were all these things that had to do with writing. So to be very honest with you as a retiree, um, and I'm not writing now, but I had thought about writing a book um, probably about five years before I was going to retire. And I'm obviously not done. I'm still working in Vietnam, which is a thrill. But I was going to stop playing. Um, af after having that thing under my chin for 40 years, I said, enough is enough. But what I used to do because of running an organization is I would get up first thing in the morning. And before I would go to the office, I would practice for an hour. So I knew that I was going to miss a very major hour or two hours of my life. And I decided that I would try to write down about my experiences because I've had a very unusual career. And I wanted to share that with other people. And many people had been encouraging me to write a book, to share all of that. So very different. I really admire what both of you do because fiction is something I don't, know how that happens. Um, having studied plays, having studied music, um, I really admire people who can put together a story and um, put that into a book. My experience is very, very different because being a memoir. I admire people who can make music. I mean, to me, <laughs> that's, that's magic. <laughs> so good yeah. for you. Thank and you. what about you, Chris? Uh, so you wrote, you generally write fiction, but you also wrote a nonfiction book. So can you tell us uh, a little bit about what those differences were in terms of inspiration and creativity. Sure, um, I would I would say that for with in in both cases, um, both my fiction and nonfiction has come from obsessions. Um, so there 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 are things that um, that. I find myself thinking about when I should be focusing on other things, right? So they are characters um, that are in my head um, that I find myself talking to, that I find myself wondering what's going to happen to them, um, and um, and and so it's like you live with these people in your mind in fiction, um, 
in this case. And so, and then after a time, you just, I love the idea of what, how Jan is talking about inspiring as a, as a verb, like inspiration almost as a verb. That's different from being inspired. You're inspired, you're inspired by something, so it feels passive, but, 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 but actually when you, when you are inspired, it prompts you to do something, right? I love that, that formulation. So actually inspiration becomes a kind of active thing. And so that, that's where that comes in. I'm, I'm thinking about these people. I'm wondering what's happened to them. I'm, I, they're, they're pulling me toward a place. Um, and so some places I've written about have been Italy in the 1940s, have, have been an Italian American community in um, the 1950s, um, has been Italy again in the 50s um, and, um, and in multiple books. And, and so it pulls me there and it, and it, and it makes me want to, 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 to put it on the page. And then the same thing was true with my nonfiction, um, the, the Art of Perspective, the book of essays that I wrote. Um, I was obsessed as a writer with the question of narration, um, about, about how, how to tell a story, uh, how, how a narrator tells a story and how stories are structured through, a, through various narrative lenses. That kept coming up in classes I would teach and workshops I would teach. And it got to the point where, and I was giving lectures and, 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 and seminars about it. And it got to the point where I wanted to, to, um, to not document it, but to kind of fully explore it in writing um, and so that I could better understand it. Um, and actually, the last thing I'll say is that one of the main reasons I wrote those essays is because I couldn't figure out how to tell um, the, the uh, an, like how to, who was going to narrate the next novel that I was working on and how he was going to do it. Um, so I was like, I'm going to write a book about narration <laughs> so that I can figure out how to write this novel. And, um, and that actually, you know, worked to an extent. So. <laughs> So did you also write the nonfiction book to avoid writing the novel? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we, as I'm sure we can all speak to, like, you know, we talk about how much we love writing and, and all of that and what, and the joys it gives us, which are many, but we'll also do almost anything we can do to avoid writing. <laughs> <laughs> I just read a quote by uh, a German writer whose name, of course, I don't remember. Um, and he said that he tells his students, you have to think about, you have to seriously think about if you want to be a writer, because if you do decide to do it, you are going to be miserable. And if you don't decide to do it, you'll be even more miserable. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, di the difference though with musicians though, is we do have to practice every day if we're gonna stay at a certain level. So I was looking for something to replace that part of my discipline life. So it's, it's a very different kind of approach. So I just got up and wrote. I didn't, I didn't care what was gonna come out because I wasn't experienced like you guys were. But I said, well, let me just start writing and that will get me over the hump of missing my discipline where I made music to start each day. You know, if you start your day with Bach, it's a joy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, you know, the interesting thing about what you say is that I also teach. And um, one of the first things I tell my students is sit down and write it wrong. Don't spend a lot of time planning or getting the sentence structure exactly right because you just need to get it out. And the, the advantage I would think of writing over being a performer is that you get to do it again and again and again before you put it out. You have to do it right every time. Mm -hmm. And so my, my, big, my big challenge was that I had done grant writing for 35 years. And that's a very different kind of writing and not one I recommend because it's not creative at all. But, but you learn, at least I learned how to just, just like you say, just sit down and start writing and not care about what comes out and then kind of shape it. And at least I was able to use those skills when the book developed, which was really helpful. Yeah, grant writing pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've done plenty of that, Chris. I'm sure you've done plenty of that too. It's like, oh, please let me make up a story. Right. <laughs> much more fun. <laughs> Yeah, so in terms of my inspiration and creativity, um, I usually get an idea for a novel from something in the world, um, a piece of news, a story somebody tells me, and 
it, I, I, Chris and I know how we each write and we write very differently. Um, he's hearing characters in his head, but for me, I need to start with story. So I get an inspiration. So example for, for my new book, Metropolis, it was an article about people moving out of a self storage unit. You know, that was my inspiration. Then it's like, well, how could I write about a bunch of people who are move, who live or, or work in a self storage unit and make the story come true. So I, I have kind of a crazy process, but I focus on the story first. And my first draft is really, really bad, but I try to get the story out. Then draft after draft is, you know, getting the characters, getting the words, getting the environmental cues. Um, and, you know, they do say that, you know, um, it's 1% uh, inspiration and 90% perspiration. And that is exactly how I experience it. Uh, creativity. I, I don't know. Would, would you two say that you're very creative? In, in yeah. terms of, well, I mean, in, in, I mean, I, it's a funny. It's such a funny question because, of it's, course, I'm a creative yeah. writer, so I right, have right, to say right. that I'm creative. Um, but, um, but, um, but I, I guess, I guess I would. I, I mean, I think of it more in terms of drama for me. <laughs> like I, I see, or and 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 and, um, like I, I see everything scenically and dramatically, right? I see every, and that part of that comes from my, I think my my. Um, my ethnic background, I come from a big Italian family where they are very melodramatic. Everything is a story, everything is a drama, Every uh, all the emotions are at, at this pitch at all times. And so that's kind of also the stuff that I write about um, as well. And so in some time, sometimes that, and, 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 to get, and to render it on the page, you of course have to use creative tools, right? You have to use you know, point of view and imagery and, and setting and all these things that are creative tools. Um, but sometimes it feels, um, it doesn't feel creative because you're drawing on so much that you already know so well. Like in my case, I'm drawing on often on, you know, um, stories I've heard from family and, and just being in, in, in that world. So you almost, you almost feel like you're cheating because, well, I'm not being creative because I'm just writing about stuff I know. But of course, the way you're writing about it is that you're writing creatively and 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 you're and you're painting with words and you're dramatizing with words and you're including a soundtrack and uh, the cinematography and all of that and uh, you know in your novels and things like that so in that sense you know i would say that that i'm a that i am a creative writer <laughs> so uh, and but i don't I, but i don't know how to like you know uh, weave baskets or or do anything <laughs> else, else nothing else creative I can I can I do yeah no. no you are you are creating something and I know as a musician there's a difference in music between the composer who is the creative person who is creating a work of art like you guys are creating a book as opposed to me as an instrumentalist as a violist where I was a, I'm a recreator. I'm not creating what's being played. I am recreating it so that it can be heard. And that was what was interesting about writing a book because I was creating something for the first time. But creative is, is used very broadly. Um, and really, if you are creating something, you're creative, you know, it just depends whether, um, one thing that I'm very, that I talk about a lot in my book is the difference between art and entertainment. And it was from my drama professor, the late Peter, Dr. Peter Arnott at Tufts, who said many years ago in a course about Greek and Roman theater that art makes you think and entertainment keeps you from thinking. And we need both. There's one is not better or different than they're different, but one is not better than the other. We need them both, but you have to understand the difference between them. And it's the same thing with being creative. You know, if you're just imitating someone, you're not truly creative. If you're just copying someone, those are ways to learn skills towards being creative. But that's that's very different from uh, being a Steve Jobs or an Albert Einstein. They're creative. You know, they can be scientists or technical tech people but they are creative. 
Um, yeah, in the broad sense, you know, obviously, you know, I'm a novelist, I, I'm creative, but I feel more in many ways like it's more craft, you know, and that I have um, I, this, my new mo novel is going to be my ninth novel that I published, but I have written 14 of them. <laughs> the old oh, wow. and published part. And so there are those skills that, it, you know, like Chris was saying, so you're, you're, I'm pulling the story from real life and then there are all the craft skills. And I just feel like it's, you know, that people feel that I'm creative and I don't feel like I'm quite as creative as everybody else does. You're shaking your head, Chris. <laughs> yeah, you're wrong, Barbara. <laughs> Sorry. Um, because you're, you're talking about creative tools and and it's it's like saying like, I mean, a, a, paint, a painter isn't creative because they're using a, a brush. I mean, and a brush is not a creative thing, but it's what you do with the brush, right? And and so, uh, I mean, that's the way I would, I would, I would, you know, I would look at, it. I think, I mean, I've read your books. I know how creative that, you know, you are. And I know that, you know, other people, this is the way maybe you could think about it. Other people like you're, you, okay. So you heard that story about the self-storage facility, right? I'm sure other people heard that story too. What did they do with it? Like nothing, right? They, they, they didn't make anything out of it. They didn't apply any creative tools to it. And if they did, it would look completely different from, from yours. And, and so you're bringing your sensibility your, you know, and your your craft and your imagination and all of that to your self storage story, and that's where the creativity comes from. And the guy down the street who would write it would do it completely differently, and um, and probably less creatively, if I may venture. And and I think most fields have those issues. You know, a compose a composer has to put the notes down on the page. It's not just what's in his head. Or a painter has to get the canvas, figure out where they're going to put all that together, what medium they're going to use. That's all part. That's why what I said about process is really important. I mean, uh, the editing process of a book. Yeah. Oh my God, that was <laughs> incredible. It was just like the craziest situation of you want that word or no, you said that twice and all of these things come up. And um, and it's really important because it's a, a final document. It's something, you know, you're not going to go back in and fix. You have to get to a point where you go, I'm done, you know, I'm finished. And I was lucky I had a wonderful friend who was a great editor who worked with me, but we really took our time. You know, we weren't in a rush with it um, because unlike you guys, I, I'm not concerned with selling. <laughs> um, but it was, it was an interesting process. I'd never been through that before. I've been through it in, in editing a play or editing a composition, but never with writing. And boy, did I learn a lot from that. Yeah, so maybe we should talk about editing. So Chris, you know, how, how do you edit? How many drafts do you do? How do you approach the whole thing? Well, you already, you already like, um, you already indicated that we work very differently and that's completely true. Um, I, uh, we've had many, Barbara and I have had many conversations about our different writing writing styles, um, editing process. And um, I, 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 I am deeply envious of Barbara's because it just seems like so much more fun to me. <laughs> um, but, um, and, but, 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 but my process is what I always, is the opposite of what I tell my students to do. <laughs> um, uh, I want my <laughs> students to write like Barbara, writing just bad drafts and then, and then fixing them up and just working through them and just churning them out, um, like churning out the drafts, I mean, um, but, but my process is um, writing sentence number one and then polishing sentence number one, polishing sentence over and over and over and over and over again until I get it right. And then moving on to sentence number two and then polishing that and polishing that and polishing that and then starting over with sentence number one. And then be, and, and now that sentence number two has been written, it has changed sentence number one. So I have to start back at sentence number one. And, 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 and it is exactly the most, it is the least efficient way to write anything, but I'm just someone who's deeply, I'm obsessed with language and, and rhythm and, and the cadence of the, the words. And, and, um, and, I, and, and, and so that's not that it's not, not that not, that's not important to other writers, but for me, like I can't move on to sentence three until sentence one and two are, are where I need them to be. Um, and so that's a very painstaking process, um, but, um, 
the, but what I've learned over the years, I think, is that the, the, the creative work that goes into polishing those sentences is actually the same work that would go into it if I was, um, you know, writing the whole thing out in a bad first draft. Because I'm doing the same, I'm asking the same questions like, okay, would this character say, you know, the sky is blue, or would they say it's azure, or would they say it's this or it's that? And as I'm as I'm changing the sentence, I'm actually learning about the character. I'm not just making the sentence prettier. I'm actually learning about the character, which is what I would do as well if I were writing out the long drafts. So it's just, it's the same overall process, but in different form, I think. Um, so, and then I, once I get to about 50 pages of the painstaking process with a novel, um, it starts to go much, much, much faster. Like the sentences get, get uh, much easier to write because I've, I've gotten to know the world and know the characters so well by polishing every sentence about them. So then I'm, I'm just, I'm working from better knowledge to, to create the sentences that go to the rest of the book. And when you finish the first draft, then how, how many other drafts do you do? Um, probably fewer than, than, than you because of yeah. your, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but definitely many, many drafts. I mean, 10 to 20 drafts, I would say, you know, but, but of course, you know, sometimes you're just, you're, the, that draft is really focused on like one section, you know, and then the rest is intact. And then you've changed that whole section. So then you have to actually, then you have to deal with it. So it becomes actually starts out very micro and then it gets more and more, you know, macro um, until, until the final, final version of it. See, for me, I do pretty much the opposite. Yeah. I, uh, Cause my first draft is all about story. Mm -hmm. And as I'm thinking, and story and character are actually two halves of the same coin. Um, because as you work through the story, your character develops as they come up against obstacles that they have to get through. And so I learn like you do, Chris, um, in my plot draft, yeah. who the characters are. Yeah. In my second draft, well, probably the fourth draft after that, mm -hmm. but is a character draft yeah. where I go through and really understand who these characters are. And then of course I have to rewrite the story because that changes what they might do. And then I have to, you know, rewrite all the stuff. And at the end is when I do the word stuff. Yeah. Um, once I've got the story and the character solid, but I will have to admit that I don't do the word stuff anywhere near as well as Chris does. Um, but it's oh, how can you be wrong so many times? Anyway, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> and you I'm do write on this. How to write fiction? So thank you. I'm learning a lot about writing fiction today. Thanks. <laughs> it's uh, but what I've learned from all my different writing buddies is that everybody does it differently, and often you do each book differently because it requires something else, and there's no right or wrong way. Mm -hmm. So it's just as long as you. Uh, attend to each one of the 20 things that you need to attend to, to get the book to work. It doesn't matter what order you do them. Mm -hmm. And so for you, Jan, how many did you write? It's, it's a memoir, right? So, it's, well, it's, it's, that's, what's difficult about my book um, is that it's a memoir, but it also talks about the state of the arts right now. And what was happening was I was, I started clipping articles um, when I was working saying, I need to discuss this. I need to write about this. And, and I just started building this big folder. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Bad, bad <laughs> idea. I don't recommend it at all. So when I got to the point where I said, my friends, everybody was saying, you need a book, you need a book. Okay, fine. So my first try at it was about all those issues that I wanted to talk about. The fact there's no arts education now, the fact that um, what's happening in classical music, there just a lot of things that we don't need to go down that path today, but I wanted to write about them because I felt that I had some things to say. So I wrote what I thought were the issues. And then I took it to someone whose opinion I really respected and boy, did I get cut down to size. <laughs> um, he looked at me and said, this is a memoir. 
um, you have to write what you know and what you know is yourself and there's not enough of yourself in there. And my editor said that as well and some other friends who did some reads of some chapters for me. Um, I was so grateful to all of them for helping. And I so I had to get comfortable um, with writing about myself, which I didn't think was going to be the focus of the book. Once I started doing that, then it started to make sense that what I was talking about in the field came from my experience as someone who had performed, who had studied the arts and, and all of that. So, um, so I just kept at it and I kept trying to put more of myself in and had to say, okay, I've got to develop an ego about this and, and just say, I believe this because of these experiences and that pulled it together. Um, and then I just kept editing and writing and tried to enjoy what I was talking about. It was a difficult field. I had to figure out if I was going to name names or if I was just going to be <laughs> vague. That's and I ended up story. using some of those articles, using quotes from other experts in the field to be able to say, I'm not the only one who sees this going on. And I do talk a lot about inspiration, about how all sorts of artists get inspired, whether it's Picasso or whether it's people in science, um, Einstein being a great example, Steve Jobs being a great example. So I try to um, give examples of people from other fields, just like we started off our conversation about how so many people are being creative. And yes, everybody's exposed to the same thing, but only creative people take it and run with it. So and that's Chris is going to agree with you on that people. one. <laughs> What's that? I said, Chris is going to agree with you on that one. Yeah, I, well, yeah. Barbara, it's okay. You too. Um, but to be able to come up with that story is, you know, other, Chris is right. Other people would have, might have seen that situation and not had the vision to write about it or, or the drive or the hard work and discipline to write about it. Because well, this is, is another piece of it. That, yeah. that you have touched actually two things that you've touched on. One is being able to take the criticism, which oh, is yeah. really difficult. And I have had, I have taught a lot of classes and I've been a lot of writers groups and the number of people who drop out or can't deal with it or refuse to, you know, no, it's my story. You know, you can't. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I got that criticism from the person I really wanted to have read the book. I was set back a year at that point. Yeah. I well, just stopped. It, it happened. Because I went, oh, I can't write this. I can't do this. I have no business doing this. I'm not, a, I'm not a writer. But then everybody around me, especially my husband, everybody else, they just said, no, you can do this, you know, just redo it, think about it. And I took the time to think about it. But again, I'm a musician. We get criticized for all the time. time. You're yeah. out of tune. You're you not with that get, one. Um, you need to practice more. So, so criticism, if you can't take it as a, I'm a performing artist. If you can't take criticism as a performing artist, you can't be a professional. And if you can't take criticism as a writer, you can't be a writer. I just, I just finished the first draft of my next book and it's really, really bad. And I gave it to my writing partner. And uh, I, so I gave it to some experts to check my facts and stuff. And so the experts thought it was great. My writing partner says, you got to start all over from the beginning. Oh, no. You got, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. And I said, well, you know, if the lawyer and the art therapist thought it was really good. She said, well, then go with them. <laughs> yeah. What do they know about writing? She knows about writing. And, uh, but I think you get, you know, it's, it is about ego and you just learn that if you're, if people are coming from a place of knowledge that they're going to make it better. Yes. And yeah. that's, that's what you want. And, and, then it you is about the, and it is about the process because 
the criticism is part of that process. And yeah. can you take it and turn it into something constructive? Because as a musician, please, I want to know it's out of tune. I don't want to play out of tune. Yeah, I right. want to write this better, you know, in your right. particular case. You, you, and you're going for the right opinion, obviously. Yeah, right. Well, I wish I weren't, but that's a whole different story. Well, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the other part of this is the discipline and the persistence part. Mm -hmm. So I have certain tricks that I do to get myself to keep writing. Uh, so Chris, do you have some tricks how do you how do you get yourself to do it besides writing a whole other book so you <laughs> it is i i will put out a plug for that like of of, of working uh, like not, working on also two on two projects at the same time because um because while i was working on the essays i was kind of dabbling with the novel trying to figure it out and when i would get tired of or i would get frustrated with the novel i would work on the nonfiction. And, it, and it, there's no, there's something that feels good about, you know, being transgressive or cheating on your, on your, on your book. Like, Ooh, like I'm going to cheat on my book by working on another book. And so you're treating, you're, you're like thinking that you're doing something bad and transgressive, but really you're still working. Um, so that, that's, that, that's one little trick that, you know, that, 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 that I've done, but more practically, it's, it's really, this is not something other people haven't said, but really just treating a very creative, messy process as like get, putting as many practical restrictions around it as possible. So treating it like a part-time job, like um, uh, showing up, every, I put it on my calendar, like you're writing from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and sometimes you're, 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 you know, your minimum is 500 new words or whatever. And so you, you make it into something very mundane and you know like you were have to do your taxes or something that day and and you show up to that um every day to do that and then you stay there whether you're right you know no matter how frustrated you are with it um and um so i mean that's the you know again it's it's yeah, common the sort of common trick um and then one other little like uh trick that i've learned or two other ones that i've learned lately and, and i'll keep them short one is um the Pomodoro method, do you know about this one? Where, um, where you write for 25 minutes, but where you turn off all of your, you know, you, you shut your internet down, turn your, put your phone away and you set a timer for 25 minutes um, and you just, you're committed to those 25 minutes. And then for five minutes, that's when you can check your email, then you can like answer the phone and check and see, make sure the world's still spinning. And then you go back to, and you go back for another 25 minutes. So these like little half hour blocks, like 25 plus five, because part of my frustration sometimes, I'm like, I'm so curious, like what's going on in the world? Like, should I check my email, whatever? But like, if I know I'm only gonna do this for 25 minutes, I know I can wait that long to, to check my email. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing is another sort of common uh, thing that has worked really well for me is to, is to handwrite, um, part, handwrite certain elements of the book and then uh, write on the laptop with other elements. So I keep a, a ongoing journal that is, really a journal it's not sketching out scenes it's literally just talking to the characters like just being very almost like new agey about it you know like checking in with them like writing what the, what's in their diary um just writing random thoughts about them like that's where all my messy stuff is like you talk about Barbara like it's all in these handwritten pages that are like this high in terms of you know and I almost never go back to them they act as almost like the conscience or the or the Kind of subconscious, I should say, of the of the novel, um, and um, and then when I'm working on the laptop, that's when I'm doing the like scene building and the sentences mm -hmm. and making them great. Maybe so. I should try that. <laughs> it's fun. It's totally free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why that's why I decided to go right at the library. We have a uh, beautiful okay, library. That's another here. trick. Get out of the house. And, and actually, we used to perform there. We used to do concerts there. And I love the place so much. And, and I just thought, I'm going to go to the library because then I can't escape. I can't, I can't talk to anybody. I can't yeah, do anything. Yeah, yeah. They did have Why a coffee go shop. To was helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same. Yeah. Getting out. Uh, for me, I, I do the same thing as Chris. I have my three page minimum. And the other thing that I always say to my students is the way you have to write is you get your butt in the chair and you don't leave. And yep. again, if you write it wrong, you write it wrong. But there's one other topic I wanna get to uh, before the Q&A and that's 
publishing. I know that there are a lot of people in the audience who are interested in, in the publishing piece. So again, pretty quickly, um, well, I'll tell you my story pretty quickly. Um, and we should end on Jan because she has a very different story. Uh, so I, um, I quit my job and wrote a novel, which didn't get published, which often happens. And then I wrote another novel that actually did get published. And then I got four more after that published, but nobody read any of them because they were published really poorly. Then I wrote three more novels that never were able to get published. And I was gonna quit. And uh, then I decided to take one more shot. And I wrote a novel that turned into The Art Forger, which was you know, my breakout book. And then everything changed. So it was a, and then I became, you know, an overnight success after 25 years in the trenches and, and writing all of this stuff, but it, it did happen. So Chris, what's your story? Um, well, quickly, I want to say, you know, we mentioned earlier this idea of criticism and, it, and, and related to criticism is rejection, right? And essentially what Barbara, you dealt with in many ways was rejection. And just like with criticism, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you dealt with it and you, and you pressed on. And I do think the difference between for lack of a better word, like real writers or real artists are that you, that you kept on, like you just kept doing it. And you said you were gonna give it one more try with the Art Forger. I don't, again, I don't believe that either yeah, because right. if that hadn't worked, you would have kept going. Like oh, right. you would have still kept going because it mattered to you, right? And, and you in a way couldn't live without it on some level. So, um, so I do think that's the difference between writers who end up publishing or end up being however you define success um, and, 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 and writers who don't, is that it, it, if it matters enough to you, you just keep doing it. Like you just keep taking the hits, Crazy. criticism, Crazy. Um, rejection, you just keep taking it and keep going back to it because it matters so much to you. Um, and, um, and, I'll, and then my path is super fast. I was in an MFA program and um, uh, someone in my program ha um, already had an agent and she thought, oh, I think my agent would like your manuscript that you're working on in this, in this, in this, um, in this MFA program and introduced me and um, and that agent took it on and it's a long saga but she ended up selling it and then and then I kept going from there and and that and the only point about that is don't dis any of you out there thinking about writing don't discount uh, and don't don't think that writing doesn't the writing world the art world means or like that you don't have to know people right it knowing people and having connections social connections professional connections are often a shortcut to getting, you know, to getting um, publications or to any sort of that, that, that kind of success. Um, it's just like any other business, like the publishing side is a business and, and it matters who you know sometimes. Sometimes you don't realize who you know actually. Um, so putting yourself in writing spaces, creative spaces, meeting people, making connections, not so you can, you know, use them, but, but, but because you're all gonna help each other um, eventually somehow to, um, to be successful. Which we all do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. those, those were two yes, very different yes, publishing did. stories. And so Jan, uh, quickly tell us your yes. publishing story. So as a musician, you are used to being turned down. You are used to having to come back and try again. So I'm a very determined person. And so I thought, well, with my credentials and all this, somebody will publish it. To make a long story short, I tried the agents. I tried the publishers. I have a cousin who is a multiple Newbery Award winner with one of the top four publishing companies. Luckily, I got a great quote out of his publisher who at least told me I had a compelling book, but at my age and with the subject matter, they couldn't sell it. There's no way. A publisher has to know how they're gonna market the book. And so I was getting very depressed and luckily I, you know, I do research and I found that there was such a thing as self-publishing. And since I know there are a lot of seniors in the audience today, if you wanna write, do it. You might not get a published book, but if you wanna write something, go ahead. But self-publishing today is a great alternative. There was one question about someone wanting to publish their father's uh, photos and things. You can do it if you want. You won't sell it, but at least you will have it in hand. 
So luckily the company that produced the last two um, CDs that we did of the 30 um, has a publishing arm and they're called Book Baby. And I, they are, I recommend them highly and at least you can take a look at them for self-publishing. But the thing is today, all authors have to, whether you're traditional or self-published, you have to spend time on social media, promoting, doing, both of you two do a great job at it. And it, even if you're self-published, you have to do all of that. There are awards you can get. There are so many resources. Um, they can put your book up online. Uh, book Baby has a hosting thing so that you can connect to Amazon and to all of the uh, top selling sites. So um, just look up self-publishing. There are lots of companies and you just find one that's a good match for what you want to do. And I had a wonderful experience with mine and I have my book published. Right. So, um, and there's ways and, and uh, to, to give them out and you're not gonna get rich, but you at least <laughs> have the satisfaction of knowing you are a published author. You definitely yeah. published author. Excellent. It's not, it, it's not, I would say it's not second class, it's an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so it's a good one. That's, that's good. All right. Well, I think there are quite a few questions. So I'm going to turn this back over to Amy and she's going to read the questions. Hi, I just want to thank you guys for being here. This has been amazing so far. Um, I think you have a lot of aspiring writers and people that didn't know they wanted to be writers um, or musicians or artists before getting here. So I appreciate your time. Just one of the things you guys haven't hit on that I think applies to Barbara and Chris a little bit more is the question was about when you've written multiple novels, um, you know, drawing on stories or your life, how do you kind of make sure you're not being repetitive? You know, if you're not using a character throughout the novels, like how are you not like writing a character and being like, that kind of sounds like Joe from my first, no you know, like just how do you work with that and, and kind of keep in line, you know, Barbara said, you said, forget how many books you had and how many you've written versus published. And, you know, just with that, how do you kind of keep it in line? I don't. <laughs> I just discovered in my new book that I had named a character the same name as, as a past book, and they were kind of similar. So I definitely have to change his name. Um, my books aren't, I mean, Chris can address this because he has three books that are have similar characters in them. But uh, my books, uh, they're, you know, the last few have been about art and there's been suspense and things, but they take place in different in, in different time periods, even they're about different kinds of art and the protagonists are all very, very different. So I think I have less of an issue with that because in every book, I'm putting my characters into such a different situation that it doesn't happen all that much, except for text. <laughs> and I would say that, I mean, honestly, I just, I'll, I'm just telling the same story over and over again. <laughs> and, and then all we do is tell, I mean, I feel like so many writers I know, it's the same story over and over again in different ways. And and one, one example is I can't somehow not write mother-son relationships. Um, and, 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 and in my in my more recent novel, my most recent novel, which was about the relationship between Tennessee Williams and his partner, I was like, well, there are no mothers and sons in this story. And, and, um, and I ended up, and I said, I'm not gonna write a mother and son. And then I ended up writing a character, two characters, an older woman and a younger man who weren't technically mother and son, but they had such a mother and son relationship. And I did not realize this, I'm embarrassed to say, until maybe a year after this book came out. Right? Like then it did not occur to me that, that I had recreated a whole other maternal, you know, mother-son relationship. So almost like, it's kind of amazing at how much time we put into each of our books and yet how much of it remains mysterious and how much of it remains subconscious. And, and we can try as hard as we can not to tell the same stories or to, or to go back to the same well for different thematic stuff and it just comes out, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> I'm on mute. We've had a lot of questions about publishing and about kind of the process. Um, and I guess one of the questions that's come up is, you know, 
when do people bring their stories once it's written? When do you bring it to an agent? I mean, there's been questions about, do I need a writing partner? Is there, do I need a community of writers? Do I read it to my cat? You know, who are you reading your stories to? Who are you bouncing ideas off to? When do you kind of know when to take each of these steps um, as you go along in your process? Um, I think that particularly for fiction, but for nonfiction also, you need, you need a writer's group or somebody who also is writing to work with and to have them critique your work because you can't see your own stuff. I mean, when you're writing, you're like here in the, in the you know, down and dirty stuff and you need somebody who can see it and give you, can see it as a whole and then give you constructive criticism. And it's gotta be somebody that you trust. Mm -hmm. But even after all of that and all of the, and like I have friends, I know Chris does too, writing buddies and we swap manuscripts after they're pretty well, you know, after, after 10, 15 drafts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then you take all of this in and you make the changes that you want and you still don't know if it's ready. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have a deadline, mm -hmm. you know, or. Uh, but it's also, it's also different for you guys being fiction writers as opposed to a nonfiction, where in my research, you know, it's the agent who hopefully, you know, getting the agent who will hopefully shop it to the publisher. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you know, they shop it around to the different companies. And I went through that process. I mean, I did my research. I tried to match up my subject matter. I tried to play up my Grammy award, all of those things mm -hmm. and nothing worked. Absolutely nothing worked. And the day I finally decided I was gonna self publish was one of my happiest days because I thought, great, I will actually have a book in hand. And the other process, I'm just too old at this point. And I had to accept it and accept that my subject matter was not something broad that was going to make money, but that's not why, why I wrote it. I mean, my, I'm advising a young woman in Vietnam. She's read my book cover to cover. Boy, has that saved me time in advising her. <laughs> so, so it's been worthwhile and I loved the process and I loved what I learned about publishing, but I I also wasn't ignorant about it because we had 30 CDs, which is a similar type of yeah. process. It's not the same, but it's a similar type of process. Um, I would also note that it has nothing to do with your age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, it really so. doesn't. It really <laughs> doesn't. It, it's not an age related thing. I think you're right. It, the to it was topic related. Well, know? it was also, uh, shall I say, not so much age, but am I going to be able to write another book that, that, that the agent, well, but that the agent wonders that since this is my first book at this age. And then you say, yes, there. I can write another book. <laughs> I don't know. And then you have to do it. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, uh, people forget that uh, when they get, you know, rejected by an agent or whatever that, you know, of course my immediate reaction is always, well, I'm, I'm if I'm terrible like I have no talent right but but we but again it's a business and the agent only cares about whether they can sell that book to as many people as possible which Jan Absolutely. said and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good book or a bad you know it the, the, like it's not a verdict on the quality it's a verdict on the marketability of it um and so if so you had mentioned that your topic may have been like not have a wide as wide a range as they would want. And that is a perfect um, situation for, for, you know, for self-publishing because then you have control and then you're marketing to directly the, to, to the people who the you people know who want it. Yeah. Who want it. And, and some people, no matter what their age, I, like, I know writers who do both. They have an agent for some of their work and then they have, and then they self-publish other of their works that they know are gonna have a, probably a smaller reach. Right. And, um, and, 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 and they also, to, to be self-published, I think you have to have a kind of like love for the, for the marketing side. You have to be sort of well-organized. You, um, you have to be patient and deal with all kinds of logistical things. I have none of those skills. So I, I just need, need an agent. to hand it over. I need an agent to hand it over to that person to deal with the business so that I can focus on the, on the creative side of it um marketing and i mean promotion like going out and giving readings and all, that's a different thing that's a whole other that's 
step three. Um, and, and I actually really enjoy that part of it. Um, it's the publicity I like, marketing I don't like, if that makes any sense. Um, and, uh, and obviously the creative part I, I like the best. Yeah. All right, probably got a couple more minutes, so a couple of questions. One, we've had a couple uh, forms of this question is how, you know, Chris, you said when I sit down 25 minutes, I turn my phone off, you know, or I'm, I'm going over this one sentence a billion times, blue or azure, I've, I have that in my memory now, but how much for each of you is in your mind when you're sitting down? You know, do you have it, how much research has gone in or how much, you know, how far along are you on the story? Are you kind of just starting with this character or starting with this sentence and then just, it builds from there? I think a lot of people are kind of stuck on, you know, they have these ideas, but when do they sit down and write? Yeah. And I'm sure oh. it differs for all of you. Yeah, it's different for everybody, but I'll use the familiar um, quote um, from Yael Doctorow, which is always the one I always go back to, and I've heard it a million times, right? Is writing a, dry, sorry, writing a novel, I'll mess it up though. Writing a novel is like driving a car at night. Um, you can get the whole, you can get where you need to go that way. Wait a minute, I am going to mess it up. <laughs> you, Barbara, you say it. No, no, <laughs> I, I'm going to mess it up too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you can, like, you're, you know, you're going to, Sorry, you're gonna get all the way to where you need to get, but you can only get as far as your headlights take you, right? You can't see all the way to the end. You can only see what's right in front of you. And that's, again, somebody find the quote and put the, put the real quote up because it's so much better than that. But the, just the idea that you can only write, you know, a scene a day, a couple pages a day, uh, you can only get from, from, you know, a little part, like just step by step by step by step, one foot in front of the other, um, to build a novel, to build a story, to build a memoir, whatever it is. Um, and, um, and that's all you need to focus on on that day. And the, and the other cliche, you know, a page a day is a book a year. You know, that's another, another way to think about it, right? If you write a page a day, you've got 365 pages. And that is something, that, that is clay that you can mold and turn into something else. But you can't, you're not going to write 365 pages on day one. And you don't have to. And they would be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and one last question, because we're, I know I want to make sure you guys each get a chance to answer this. Um, I know this, you know, this is tough senior connection. We have some retirees on this call, but we also have some current students as well. So for no matter where people are in their journey, um, do you have advice for them? I know you all took different, you know, there's been questions. Do I need to get a PhD? Do I need a master? Do I need to do journalism? You know, you've all taken different things. So what advice, if you can go back and talk to you 20 years ago or 30 years ago, would you give um, to those people who are looking to do this? You know, obviously you can start at any age, but especially for those, uh, the current students that are on the call. Follow your heart and develop discipline, go to work each day and don't worry about the bigger things and just do what you want to do. If you want to write, I don't have degrees in writing. I mean, I have a degree in, in drama. I have a degree in music. Um, I ended up going a very different path, but you just have to follow your heart. I would say um, um, that um, there's no, I'm going to speak specifically to, you know, fiction and novels and all that. Um, there is no, there, there is no trick. There, there's no formula out there for any, for, for anything. You can buy as many how-to books as you want, as many manuals, you can get as many degrees, you can get as many MFAs as you want. There's no one out there that has all the answers. Um, every novel is different. Every creative pro project is different. So um, you, like, the way to figure out what kind of book you want to write is to just write it in all the ways that we've been talking about and to read as much as humanly possible um, because reading just it just builds reading is the exercise of writing right it is building all your muscles the more you read the more you're building up all your muscles to be able to get you to to write the thing that you want to write i couldn't agree with that more so if you're interested in writing fiction read novels and you will develop a kind of muscle memory for story and character that will take you much farther than any specific academic. I mean, I have three degrees in sociology, 
I never took a writing class until after I wrote my first book that didn't get published. And then I took a writing class at the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. That's, you know, I, I didn't have anything. And I'll end by saying that Chris once told me that that was a good thing that I wasn't contaminated by an MFA program. So, you know, whatever. I think all of this advice is really good advice. And if you really want to do it, just do it because just do why it. not? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I will say the MFA was work for some people, but if you, if you don't have one, that actually also can be an advantage too. It's, it's whatever you've got, you know, it's whatever anyone can do. This is the other beautiful thing about writing. Really, truly, it is the most portable art form you, you can, anyone can do it. It is, you, and you can do it anywhere and, um, and, and anyhow. So um, there's, no, there's no right or wrong way. It's, it's endlessly, endlessly possible. And study the people you admire. You know, if there are writers that you love, find out what their path was. Doesn't mean they're gonna teach you, mm -hmm. but you should at least find out what their path was and say, how did they become someone I really admire? And that usually leads you down the right path. I also want to thank Carrie. I, I dropped it in the chat, but I don't know if the panelists saw. Writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Perfect, right? <laughs> we're, close. Yeah. we're close, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Close enough. Close enough. Bumbled, bumbled through that one. <laughs> we, all get the, we all get the idea. <laughs> thank you so much for putting that in there. Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Dixon from the Tough Senior Connection. I'm sorry we have to put an end to this, but we did promise to be through by six o'clock. Um, well, first, it certainly looks like we have a lot of future Tufts alumni authors out there from, <laughs> from listening to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, Chris, and Jan, for your honesty and for your humor in, in telling us your stories. We are so proud that you are a member of the Tufts family. And to the audience, thank you. You were so engaged. And to all the aspiring authors out there, uh, hopefully Barbara, Chris, and Jan have helped you move forward on your creative journey. And thanks as always to Amy and Karen for hosting and producing this webinar and handling all the technical details so flawlessly. Uh, I wanna give a quick commercial looking ahead to a couple of our future programs. Uh, scheduled the first one for January, 2022. It's going to be provocative, informative and very timely. Healthy people, healthy planet, how what we eat contributes to the climate crisis. And then later in March, we're going to do a program about politics, looking to the midterm elections. Two of our favorite professors, Professor Itan Hirsch and Brian Schaffner from the Political Science Department are going to talk about why 2022 matters. So stay tuned. In the meantime, this concludes our presentation. We look forward to, as always, we look forward to uh, learning your feedback. Thank you all for attending. Again, panelists, thank you. And until we meet again, good evening. Thank you. Yeah.